demanding and exacting their civil liberties, their uh, question of social justice. Uh, perhaps the single most important slogan of the Egyptian revolution, Alaish, Red, Aladana Ijtimaiya, or Ijtimaiya as they say, social justice, what Karam al Insaniya, human dignity. Uh, remains definitive to what these revolutions are all about. So economic, social, cultural uh, uh, aspects of the revolution. And the revolutions have uh, uh, spread. Uh, I'd rather for us to have conversation rather than me to have a monologue, but I have uh, jotted down a few points that I, I, I share. Number one is the multiplicity of sites of these revolts that we need to uh, keep in mind. Uh, these things began perhaps with the, uh, the, what we call the Green Movement uh, in Iran in the June of uh, 2009, post-presidential election. And uh, I remember I was uh, a part of a, of a discussion in the Al Jazeera program with Marwan Bishara Empire in uh, July of uh, 2000, uh, 2009. And, uh, in the middle of a conversation, I said, if I were a person in a position of uh, authority anywhere between Morocco and Syria, I would watch what's happening in Iran closely, because it will happen in those countries. Uh, the reason for that uh, anticipation was the demographic disposition of uh, Iran, 75 million, 80% uh, under the age of 40, 50% under the age of 25. The same demographic disposition exists in the Arab uh, world from Morocco to Syria. It's a young generation that is simply fed up with uh, status quo ante. Uh, and so soon, within a year and a half, the thing is started in Tunisia, then in Egypt, then uh, in Yemen, uh, uh, Libya, etc. And uh, before you know it, or just before it, we had similar, exactly not identical, similar uprisings in uh, Wisconsin uh, when labor unions were being banned. Some demonstrations were happening. This is before the rise of the so-called Occupy Wall Street movement, which subsequently happened and was quite significant for at least the year. And then simultaneously with it, as you well know, the Eurozone crisis extending from uh, Greece, uh, Greek labor unrest to uh, indignato in, uh, in uh, Spain, down to student unrest in your own country, student uprisings uh, against tuition hike, uh, which was picked up again in Canada. So something is in the air, maybe it's in the water we're drinking, maybe it's uh, <laughs> in the absurdity of the ruling class that uh, it just simply gets sillier and sillier, whether they are Arab or Muslim or Iranian or American or European, they're just simply to be, have been bred by a different uh, DNA. And people are just fed up with it. Uh, but uh, uh, we have to be careful not to, uh, uh, not to assimilate all of these revolts together, obviously, into each other. Obviously, they come from different political culture, in different contexts. There are certain things that uh, this very conversation we're having here in London, to some extent, is possible, but to some other extent may not be possible. We can't have it in Tehran or in Saudi Arabia or uh, in Bahrain, for example, uh, or any number of other uh, countries. So the multiplicities of these sites, from a theoretical perspective, is very crucial to keep in mind. And w without assimilating them into each other, yet recognizing something is global, is happening as, for example, Alan Badio begins to notice in his uh, recent book. Uh, the other aspect of these multiple sites uh, is uh, the fact that the received geography that we have is no longer working. Take, in fact, the very expression Arab Spring, or Arab revolts, or Arab revolutions. They limit you to look at the Arab countries from Morocco to Syria and from Syria down to Yemen. And identical events such as self-emulations or protests in front of uh, governmental uh, 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 buildings have happened from anywhere from Djibouti to, uh, to uh, uh, other parts of Africa, but because they are under the radar of our imaginative geography of the Arab world, we don't pay attention to them. 
whereas Africa is very much integral to, uh, to these events. Or when we say Arab, obviously we're not considering Muslim countries, okay? So Af if things that are happening in Afghanistan or things that are happening in Pakistan or in, or in Iran are not part of uh, the thing. This, as a result, we have to use these expressions, Arab or anything else, under erasure, recognizing that these geographies are not uh, sufficient and uh, they are as much revealing as blinding us into recognizing the full dimensions of what is happening. For example, the student uprising in Quebec, which is one of the most significant events that happened, didn't co it was not part of the Occupy Wall Street uh, movement, but uh, imagine in the imaginative geography of our politics, it kind of fell into crack. People were not following it. Whereas in these dimensions was no less significant than a student uprising here in the UK, or the labor uprising in, in Greece, or the Indignato in, in Spain, or the Occupy Wall Street uh, in the US, or the initial aspects of the Arab uh, Spring. So that's, uh, no, uh, the, the final thought about these multiple sites is uh, theoretically, I have started thinking that instead of uh, theorizing ala our comrades uh, 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 Hard and Negri, whether we're in imperialism or empire, what are the particular modes of domination, we need to switch our analytical tools, begin to think of resistance to domination. That needs far more uh, theorizations. And uh, comparative works I have found exceedingly important. In my own thinking and in writing the Arab Spring, I found the uh, extraordinary work of Hannah Arendt book on revolution in which she compares French and American revolution and prefers the, the American revolution. Why? Because the American revolution was for, for the constitution of the public space, irrespective of the economic aspects. Public space became uh, a, a critical issue through her very creative reading of the phrase in the American constitution and life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. She read the phrase, and the pursuit of ha happiness, as the pursuit of public happiness. That humans are not human unless and until they are part of the public space. For which she went to the later writings of Thomas Jefferson and uh, digged out the significance of words or borrows uh, in the formation of the uh, political, and then theorizes why is it that we as political animals, she has a Hobbesian and Jean-Jacques Rousseau reading of the political, that the political is the space in which we become public and not a haven from violence. So she doesn't come from Sorel, Marx, and Weber tradition of politics as the exercise of violence or the exclusive use of violence, as Weber called it, but as uh, politics as a space, as a haven from violence. Uh, and the book was written in the 60s, and scarce anybody other than graduate students read it, but I have found it exceedingly important in helping us uh, understand this revolution. So old books such as Hannah Arendt's uh, book on revolution uh, are very, especially because it compares Europe and, and US, become uh, critical in terms of how to understand the succession of revolts that are happening from one end of the world to, uh, to another. The second point I wanted to talk about is, uh, is too many distractions that appear that make you keep your eyes off the, the ball. The ball is the fact that from Morocco to Jordan, right now in Jordan we have unrest, to, to specifically talk about the Arab world. From Morocco to Jordan and Syria, down to Bahrain. Bahrain, again, because it's a tiny country, scarce gets uh, attention, and also because the American Sixth Fleet is there, and also because it's under the Saudi uh, control. Down to, uh, uh, to uh, Yemen, there is this global uprising. But then, one insignificant, silly manifestation of either European or American Islamophobia happens, such as this recent uh, so-called uh, clip, it's not a movie, it's a clip, uh, innocent Muslims, or the innocence of Muslims, and suddenly there is a outburst of demonstrations in uh, in Libya or in uh, Egypt or anywhere else. Then the world attend by world, and I will come back to this world attention. What what world attention? Meaning the front page of BBC or Al Jazeera or CNN. 
shifts, oh look, Muslims are out, and this um, ambassador was killed, and so forth. Whereas statistically, people have done a statistical comparison. The number of people who poured into the streets in uh, Benghazi or in uh, Cairo or anywhere else in the Arab and Muslim world with, uh, compared to the masses of millions of people who poured into the streets in the course of the Arab Revolution were entirely insignificant. Uh, so what happens is you have uh, a somebody like this man making a film, putting it on the YouTube, there are, there are demonstrations, and uh, we get theoretically, analytically, politically distracted by what is happening. So you need constantly to, need to keep your uh, mind on it. Second example is this bogus non-existent Iranian nuclear issue. Bogus non-existent Iranian nuclear issue. I'm the last person on planet Earth to defend the freaking Islamic Republic. But they don't have uh, uh, a nuclear bomb yet. Okay? And of the all countries on planet Earth who can point finger at Iran, oh, you might be thinking of developing nuclear war, is Israel to point finger at, at Iran. I mean, if Jordan or, or, I don't know, Kuwait or Bahrain is pointing finger, we know what they're doing, it's understandable. They don't have it. But certainly not Israel with that silly map of uh, Bibi Netanyahu. Uh, so that's another uh, distraction. Another distraction is when Islamophobia is being abused by the Salafis or by the so-called Al-Qaeda, whatever the Al-Qaeda is, on the model that the American hostage crisis was abused in the 1979-1980 in order, as a smoke screen, in order to, uh, under the smoke screen of American hostage crisis of 1979-1980, as I have argued on, uh, on numerous occasions, all the left forces, all the progressive forces, was destroyed. The uh, constitution of the Islamic Republic was ratified, the first parliamentary election was held, the, the first presidential election was held. During those 444 days that the world attention was distracted by 70-odd American diplomats being taken hostage in their, in their embassy, uh, 45 million at the time the population of Iran was being trapped inside a, a political ideology. And then soon after that, the Iran-Iraq war uh, began. And uh, just before his death, again, another smoke screen, uh, 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 screen uh, and a distraction was the Salman Rushdie uh, thing. As soon as people's attention was, uh, I, I mean, if I were to ask you, unless you are a student of Iranian affairs, you, you wouldn't recognize that for the duration of the so-called Salman Rushdie affair, uh, the major crisis of post-Khomeini Islamic Republic was being addressed. The constitution of the Islamic Republic was being re rewritten uh, in order to address uh, another scandal which had to do with the massacre of uh, political prisoners in, in Iran and the uh, Iran-Contra affair, the swipe, uh, sweeping of, uh, of uh, arms for hostages. Uh, so you need, as I said, there are distractions that, that don't allow you to concentrate and laser beam on what is happening and pay attention to them, understand them, follow the news, theorize them, publicize them, emphasize them, all of these things, by these sideshows that, uh, that happen. The next issue is, of course, our own friends and comrades. Where is the left on these revolutions? Beginning with the Libyan uh, NATO-led, US slash NATO-led invasion of uh, Libya, uh, during the Re uh, Libyan revolution, the left became divided. Are you for or are you against? Okay? And uh, the fear was that if NATO did not inter intervene, uh, Gaddafi will have a bloodbath and kill uh, his own people, which he perfectly, was perfectly capable of uh, doing. And if you supported, endorsed the NATO uh, involvement, obviously you were the lackey of imperialism. That is another way. The left was shooting itself, shooting its analytical tools uh, in the foot. My own position was very simple. In interview after interview, I was being asked, so what do you... Obama is on, on the phone. What would you say to him? I think what sort of an absurd question is <laughs> When Obama was selling masses of millions of uh, weapons to Gaddafi, did he ask my opinion? 
Why should I now lend whatever moral voice I have as a citizen to him? No, the, the shoe's in the other foot. If he invades, I'll call him imperialist. If he doesn't intervene and there is a bloodbath, I hold him responsible because he, holds, he, hold, uh, he, he sold weapons to them. And so far as the analytics of, of this concern, I'm not one of those professors, both British and uh, American, who received millions of dollars from Gaddafi to write good articles from, uh, for them and, write and, and say Libya is the Norway of North Africa. <laughs> Who asked them? Why should I? I mean, we as citizens have very small but effective moral voice. So I refuse to give it to uh, one way or another. I said, no, I'll wait and see what he does. Whereas the left became very much involved, are you f and then if you oppose the NATO involvement, you begin to downplay, oh no, Gaddafi is not as bad. The education was splendid under Gaddafi. We have a rehash of that scenario right now about Syria, okay, that obviously on one side you have Americans, the Saudis, the Qataris, uh, the, the Russians and the Chinese and, the, uh, and Iran conducting a, a proxy war in Syria, trying to micromanage uh, the event. And as soon as you begin to criticize the criminal regime of, uh, of Hafez al-Assad, you say, oh, so you're for American uh, intervention? And as soon as you uh, criticize American intervention, you become a lackey or you're pro Hafez al-Assad. This is how the left shoots itself in the foot. Whereas uh, the, uh, the fact, again, about Syria is, as I have said in a few articles, is that both of these contending forces, whether it is the Saudis or Iranians, they are gearing for state control. Namely, their calculus is the calculus of chopping the head of the state apparatus, in this case Bashar al-Assad, keeping, which is an entirely different calculus, keeping the body of the regime intact. So people have the uh, 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 psychological satisfaction of the killing, killing of the, or the destroying of the father figure, but the actual counter-revolutionary, repressive uh, machinery of the state apparatus remains uh, intact. Whereas my argument is that what has been let out is the civil society, public space. And this is not, these are not new things. I just, in Milano, I spent time with Jordanian, Palestinian, Syrian, Iraqi, Egyptian, journalists, filmmakers, intellectuals, university professors, etc. There's nothing happening right now over the last two or three years that Arab intellectuals uh, Iranian intellectuals, uh, South Asian intellectuals have, been, have not been talking about, articulating, theorizing for the past 30, 40, 50 years. But uh, these revolutions have happened and these revolutions have not happened because of those ideas. No uh, revolution ever has happened because Marx said something or Lenin said something else. Revolutions happen and revolutionaries ride on them. Okay, that's, that's how, how it is. And uh, happily, uh, so uh, the, the the key to it, as a result, is to keep your eyes again on the public space, on the fact that Syrian as a people, whoever is now doing the fighting up there, the Saudis, the Americans, the Iranians, Russians, etc., as as they say, you can conquer a, a land a, a land on horse, but you have to come down to rule it. Whoever wins and comes down to rule will not face the same Syrians that Bash Hafez al-Assad or Bashar al-Assad was tyrannizing for uh, over, is a whole different set of factors and forces and peoples. People simply will not uh, uh, succumb or go back to that state of fear. The last point I wanted to make is about uh, media. By rule, as a rule, no media is without... Uh, Prejudice. All media has prejudice. BBC, CNN, Al Jazeera, all of them. I remember when Al Jazeera had just started, Al Jazeera Arabic, not Al Jazeera uh, English. 
my late colleague, who was also my neighbor, Edward Said, he was elated. Oh, you have to listen to this. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's, uh, it tells everything like it is. Uh, to me, Al Jazeera was CNN in Arabic. <laughs> I mean, is the nature of media is nothing. Uh, I mean, I, I say as somebody who constant, I, I have a column in Al Jazeera. I'm delighted to have a, a column. But as I always say, you know, at the end of my column and everybody else's columns, they say Al Jazeera is not responsible for the content of this. I, I want to add, I'm not responsible for Al Jazeera either. Okay. Uh, now, here the key to it is don't trust any media by definition. If you're source of media is only BBC, that's no good. If it's only English, or it's only Arabic, or it's only Persian, or it's only Hindu, or Urdu, or whatever, is no good. If your base is only in London, is no good. I'll give you a specific example. Two nights ago, in uh, Milan, over, over eating and drinking and, and so forth, with various friends from various parts of the Arab world, one friend, a Syrian, Palestinian origin, born in a, uh, in a Palestinian refugee camp in Syria and raised in Syria, very involved with the revolution, very involved with the so-called uh, uh, Free Syrian Army. Uh, two things that I will, I will tell you about this conversation. Number one, he said, uh, there is no Free Syrian Army. It's a fiction. There are neighborhood and neighborhood after neighborhood that are picking up arms to defend themselves and to topple the regime. The, the creation of a general rubric called the Free Syrian Army is, in a way, a, a fiction. The other thing is that his younger brother was arrested, imprisoned, and tortured. And he was particularly because he had it was a therapeutic moment for him to share the specific, the detailed, gory details of the being tortured in, uh, in Bashar al-Assad's uh, torture chambers. That changes your perspective. If you're holding back and you're saying, oh, the American imperialism is doing that and the Saudis are doing the other thing, so all your analytic analytical factors are abstract political uh, issues, all of them legitimate, all of them valid, but there is no human cost. For eight months, the Syrians fought in the streets very peacefully, not nonviolent. So suddenly you can, and then they eventually picked up arms. And yes, there are gangs, yes, there are uh, kidnapping, yes, there are all sorts of atrocities being uh, uh, taking place, on both by the regime and by the aspects of the resistance. But it doesn't completely discredit the revolution. You don't, as we say, uh, throw the uh, baby and the bath water together. The key to it is to keep your, I mean, it's very easy. So pessimism, and, uh, and uh, asceticism, you know, you, you don't want to stick your neck out. I mean, as I say at the beginning of my book, this book is my way of joining the revolutionaries in the Tahrir Square, and it's my way of saying, Ashab Yuri, the Islam. People demand uh, the overthrow of the regime. And knock the wood, a year and a half into, my, uh, into the book out, I'm still very proud a member of lunch parties with my editor and publicists, I'd say. There's nothing in it that I will say, oh, I should have said it differently, etc. Uh, but again, if five years from now, three years from now, something extraordinary happens that uh, something is fundamentally flawed in the book, you know, Mali, she's okay. So what? You know? Uh, you have to be able to, to do that. And it's not just because I, I speak from a, from a secure academic position. You know, my wife and I are both academics. We teach and we live uh, paycheck to paycheck happily and perfectly fine. Okay, there's nothing that I can stand uh, in the middle of my campus and uh, when uh, idiot Ahmadinejad was invited to Colombia to my university and tell <laughs> Ahmadinejad and Bollinger, my own president, go to hell. Uh, <laughs> So it's a privileged position. Yes, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, 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 negligent of that. But nevertheless, uh, the fact is that asceticism and puritanism that, oh, I don't want to have uh, anything to do with this. Or, oh, and then uh, conspiracy theories. All, all is under control of Americans. What is, what is particularly uh, disabling on the left is to give so much power to U.S. and uh, Saudi Arabia and so forth that they can do whatever they want. 
that this whole revolution is uh, one of them. I have an idea in the book that I developed open ended revolution, that we don't have a total revolution, that complete takeover of the state. And the other, but, but an open ended. It's not a, it's not a, the other metaphor I use is not a epic, it's a novel. Okay, we don't have, a, and, and uh, thank God for that, no Gamal Abdel Nasser, no Gandhi, no Nehru, uh, just individual uh, anonymous actors, like a novel. We don't know what's going to happen in a Bakhtinian conception of a novel in the next uh, page, and that's good, that requires agency. It is easy to dismiss the entirety of the Syrian revolution because of the atrocities that, yes, indeed, are happening. The point of the argument is not to dismiss, as, as we see in the literature, uh, oh, the bankrupt left, or the, the left is, uh, is useless or, uh, or uh, collaborative with the regime, uh, the ruling regime, which is nonsense and gibberish, but allow for all of these voices, come, but be conscious of the fact that we are on the cusp of a new regime of knowledge a new way of looking at uh, things, that is, the, the geography is changing. And not with, for example, for, for the longest time, and to this day, people are afraid of Islamist takeover. And as a student of Islam for the entirety of my academic life, I have no idea what's an Islamist. What is an Islamist? Or jihadist? Or moderate? I mean, these terms that have been all created in English, French, German, Italian, it's very difficult to translate them uh, into Arabic, Persian, etc., because they are of the genealogy of the production of Islam in various dominant hegemonic uh, uh, narratives. You need to, uh, and it doesn't mean that people on, uh, on the spot in Egypt, they don't have their own issues to resolve and overcome. One of them is the term secularism. I was having conversation, I'll, I'll stop at this, with a number of Egyptian revolutionaries, and they, uh, they were concerned about the writing of the constitution by the Muslim Brotherhood, and I said, why don't you go to a mosque and, and organize? It's a mosque? Oh, well, you know, I'm a woman, and uh, I'm, not a, uh, I'm a secular. I said, well, that's your problem. The are women in mosque? And secular, well, don't be, uh, so, so what does it mean, secular? Aren't you Muslim? Your name is Zahra, your father is Ali, so you're a Muslim. I am categorically, again, as I said on previous occasions, opposed to, uh, for me, my name is Hamid, my mother was a uh, devout Shi Muslim, and my father was a devout Nasserite socialist, to come and say, oh yes, what is in Europe is happening to Muslims is really bad, but of course I'm an atheist. Oh, well, I'm an atheist Muslim. You know, what do, what do, what do you want uh, from? We're f life is full of contradictions. And uh, I give my own example as a, as a physical embodiment of a, a father and mother, a husband and wife, one a believing, practicing Muslim, and one just, as I said, just loved uh, his uh, Russian vodka and Um Kulthum, listening to Um Kulthum, and cooking for us. <laughs> okay? And they had three children with, with, uh, together. And I know for a fact, and this is the last thing I say, that my mother occasionally drank with her. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, she, <laughs> but every once in a while, I saw her ritually washing her lips and saying, Bismillah, Bismillah. And my friends who didn't know what, they thought she was whistling, that she was saying, Bismillah, Bismillah. Uh, that she, uh, she uh, also drank, and you know, life goes on. So life is full. So you cannot say, no, uh, you know, Almani, I'm a secular, I can go, don't go. Well, then that public space is being occupied by the other forces. They become more belligerent. First of all, Islam, there is no block. There are divisions happening within the Muslim Brotherhood. The younger generation, the older generation, the uh, new liberal economics, the pro more progressive economics. So there are various factors that are involved in, uh, in these formations. So uh, uh, Puritanism and, uh, and uh, 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 agnosticism is, uh, it, it doesn't work. You need to get uh, involved. I think I'm going to stop, uh, stop here. I hope I have given you where my mind is in terms of the factors that are in my mind thinking about these issues, and uh, perhaps they will generate some conversation.
cultures are identical. They're all very different. The immediate answer to your question, in my judgment, no, there is no monarchical uh, exception. Each one of them, if you look at Morocco, you remember, immediately the king said, let's uh, revise the constitution. That created a division within the opposition. Some agreed, some didn't agree. Some uh, revisions were implemented, others were not implemented. Uh, but that is the, uh, remains the case. In Saudi Arabia is a different case. You have, in Saudi Arabia, you have to keep in mind that however bastard these rulers are, they are the custodians of the most sacred, sacrosanct sites for 1.3 billion Muslims. So uh, they always say the last queen that goes uh, after the queen in chess is your queen, your queen in England. And uh, I mean, I, not your queen, <laughs> the queen of this country and uh, the Saudi king. Uh, so, but as you know, there are the, the, the Shi'i minorities uh, sure. in Egypt, there, in the, uh, Saudi Arabia, there is, a, there is an uprising, and also the women's rights uh, case, which is not as much uh, paid attention to uh, as it should be. Jordan already, we, people are out in the streets, but again, the false fear of the Islamists are, uh, are coming in. What is their agenda? Well, of course, Islamists have their agenda. The question is not, when I say, don't be afraid of the Islamists, you, you know, they're not creatures with antenna on their head. They are just ordinary citizens, and they, are, they have every right to their political thoughts, including the Quran, the Hadith, and whatever it is that they believe in. Occupy the public space. Change the, uh, the discourse. Uh, but uh, when I said I'm not a pacifist, the question is the distinction we have to make between political violence, throwing a cocktail molotov, molotov at uh, a building, and political anger. Anger and violence are two things. Anger needs to be translated into the formation of voluntary associations. Three particular voluntary associations I have identified. Labor unions. Anybody, have you read anything over the last year that talks about the Syrian labor unions? Women's rights organizations, because if you leave men labor together, it's their constitution, we are misogynists, we're just blind, we don't see. And student organizations, because this has to be transgenerational, not just one generation disappearing and then the next generation reinventing uh, the whole thing. Transformation of political anger into the formation of voluntary associations along these lines. There is nothing, I just came up with these three. Labor unions, women's rights organizations, and the student assemblies is the way for political anger not to be wasted into political violence. Okay, at the initial phases, I've had many conversations with anarchist friends, Marxist friends, etc., who were all for burning down a building here in London, wasn't it, by students uh, during the student uprising, a, a, a building was uh, burned down. I am for occupying that building. You follow? Sure. I am for turning that building into a headquarter of political demands from the, whatever ministry is in charge of tuitions, etc., not burning it down. I understand the anger and the frustration. But burning it down wastes the energy. It's the easy way. Okay. Give me one more example and then I stop. In the late 90s, uh, uh, we had a demonstration uh, uh, in, in my university at Columbia by students who wanted to have ethnic studies, the uh, Department of Ethnic Studies. And they had gone on hunger strike. They were not eating anything. Until Columbia established a uh, Center, Institute, Department of uh, Ethnic Studies. And uh, then they, uh, finally the university decided to negotiate, establish a blue, so-called Blue Ribbon Committee, and uh, the students trusted very few people uh, of the faculty. Well, I was one of them. We sat down to uh, negotiate, talk with them. The first question I asked from one of the activists was, so what are the five best models of a Department of Ethnic Studies? And he said, what? <laughs> so yeah, we want to establish a Department of Ethnic Studies. What are the best five models? No clue. You follow? Because you first have to have a solution before you put your life on, on, the, on the line. What are the possibilities? So uh, 
No, there is no monarchical exceptionalism. Each country is different from, from the other. And syncretic, they have, they have side effect. What happens in Egypt, they, they come and tell you, oh, Libya doesn't have a democratic culture, it's a tribal society, this and that. So, Arabs have an expression that books are written in Egypt, published in Lebanon, read in Iraq. Okay, of course, Iraqis don't like that because they have their own poets and intellectuals and so forth, so what we also produce. But the thing is that there is a syncretic, you follow, a syncretic sure. and transnational effect to this, that what happens in Tahrir Square has effect in Syria, in, in Manama, in uh, other parts of uh, the thing. And we have to recognize and exacerbate. One of the things that I have done, you know, that you see it into these books, bring this ghastly racialized distinction between Iranians and Arabs, cross over it and bring uh, solidarity. When there was a crackdown in, in Iran, uh, some Iranians also, oh, these are Arabs. Look how dark they look, they're, they're, they're Arabs. I mean, they look like me because uh, they, they come, people who like me come from the southern part of Iran are darker in complexion than people who come from north, northern Iran. And when the crackdown in Libya happened, what did they say? Oh, these are uh, African mercenaries. You racialize uh, the thing. So overcoming that racialization, no, they are not African, they are actually, uh, but there is African labor migration. 300 uh, million human beings are rooted in the globe in search of job, the size of the United States. I mean, that's the underlying uh, uh, force. And until recently, we thought labor from the south comes to the north in search of job, thus Islamophobia as a manifestation of it, but now the Prime Minister of Portugal said that Portuguese young people should go to Angola and Brazil yeah. and look for a job, which means the thing is more circular than uh, than the world of you know. Yeah. Yes. Let me uh, let me take them each at a time. Now the question of Israel is very critical. You see the, uh, the status quo ante that we have had it until the rise of the Arab revolutions was that for 60 plus years Israel had wedded itself. Uh, it was part of its political DNA to deal with Arab potentates, okay? Whether they were friends like uh, uh, Hosni Mubarak or even foes as Bashar al-Assad, because you're dealing with one person, okay? Whereas democracy by nature is open-ended and chaotic. I mean, look at the last Egyptian uh, uh, elections. You had a candidate of the army, you have a candidate of the Muslim Brotherhood, and you had a socialist candidate, okay? And they each had some proportionate of votes. And now Morsi is the president. But what is Morsi going to do so far as Israel is concerned? Okay. Uh, first of all, the assumption that because Iran is anti-Israel, or has a posture of anti-Israel, that it's, uh, Egypt is an immediate ally was washed away by Morsi going to Iran and telling and defending the, the Syrian revolution right in Khamenei's face. So what, as a result, is happening, and until Obama recently admitted that right now, after this revolt in the Cairo and Benghazi regarding this film, that Egypt is now neither a friend nor an enemy. This is a phenomenal development. That's number one. Number two, you may remember that Mr. Uh, Lieberman, the Israeli uh, foreign minister, a couple of years ago, just soon after the rise of the Arab Revolution, especially the Egyptian Revolution, he said something, Google it, is extraordinary. He said, Iran is not what I'm worried about. I worry about Egypt. Why would he worry about Egypt? Egypt has not even said anything that is not going to honor its peace treaty and, and so forth. But yes, Egypt is more worrisome because of the public space, because people are in Tahrir, and because Palestine is integral to all of these, uh, question of Palestine, to these uh, revolts. I mean, I wrote in, a, in an essay that, in fact, you can read Arab revolutions as the third intifada. The, the third intifada that you were hoping will happen, only, I mean, Israelis, will happen only in, in Palestine, and they can crack it down, but no, now look what has happened. And I have suggested that this bogus Iran nuclear issue that they are clinging on it, oh, we are about existential threat. Existential threat to the Jewish state, apartheid Jewish uh, state, is democracy. That's the existential threat, not uh, Islamic Republic. In fact, uh, in my reading, 
uh, Israel is very much wants to have Bashar al-Assad in power. Because what will happen after Bashar al-Assad? Suppose we have a democracy in Syria. Political parties, newspapers, journal journalists, freedom of the press, freedom of uh, uh, assembly. What will Only think of the Palestinian refugees in Lebanon or in, in Syria. What about, I mean, can you control them? But right now, how is al-Assad has a cap on all of this? He's just one figure. So in the long run, uh, again, I conclude the Arab uh, Spring with a letter by a group of uh, Israelis from the, uh, of the uh, Mizrahim origin, of, of the, from the Arab countries, that they want to join. They must join. They ha I mean, imagine this psychological barrier and this psychological that they have created themselves by these uh, apartheid walls ar around themselves. Those walls have to come down. And Israel, or to me, not Israel, Israelis as seven million plus human beings, they have to be part of that geography. If you, like me, you believe in one state solution or two state solution, or as one of my anarchist students said, no state solution, <laughs> uh, uh, whatever solution is, that Israelis as 7.5 million human beings have to come out and uh, join the bloc. We have a bloc party in the region. So the, and, and if, I mean, I, I was teaching a summer course last year as I was writing the book. I had a sort of a, uh, uh, what you call a symbolic bet with my students. We're not able to bet with our students. Mm -hmm. That by the end of the semester, Israelis will join the block party. And by the end of the semester, you had the tent uprising in Tel Aviv. I mean, I'm not glorifying, but if you read Gideon Levy, uh, for example, great Israeli commentator writes for Haaretz, you will realize that what people like Gideon Levy were making of the tent uprising was not exactly what others were making of it. It, has, it had dimensions beyond just the question of house shortage, that Netanyahu said, oh, we have house shortage, how about if we grab some more Palestinian land <laughs> so we can uh, address them. So this is so far as the, uh, the Israel is concerned. Uh, native uh, informers. Native informers are of two kinds, those who inform the public and those who inform the power. Are you with me? Where, where are you? You see? Yeah. Uh, when I use the term native informer for a certain unnamed person, I meant it when you sit down next to uh, Wolfowitz and you tell him what he wants to hear, not what they ought to know. But there's another native informer which tells the public what they ought to know. Namely, constructing solidarity for the uprising, rather than means of repressing them. Okay? Right now, a young Pakistani girl has been shot by this bastard, uh, what's, what you call it, the so-called Taliban, because she's for, for education. Okay? Publicizing that and creating solidarity with women's rights movements, with education rights movements, in Europe, in the United States, in Australia, is absolutely necessary. But using it as an excuse to send drones, that's a different abuse of that, system, that fact. So the question is, how do you choose to uh, interpret that? Okay. Now, as to uh, the, the question of Iran, the... Uh, the uh, Nonviolent, for which I'm completely for nonviolent. Even in Syria, I'm for nonviolent. I don't think, uh, particularly the human cost. I don't think that this, the turn to violence, will will ultimately, in the long run, distract from the Syrian revolution or even from the Libyan revolution. But uh, it will. It has incredible human cost. I mean, just look at the sacrifices that Syrians have made. It's just unconscionable. But yes, your point is well taken that Iranians had a revolution like this uh, 30 plus years ago. So it's in a different political. No two countries, not just Iran and the Arab world. If you compare Tunisia and Egypt, these are two different political cultures. Egypt is so significant because it's 19 million and is the intellectual capital of the Arab world. And it is historically 25, 30 years from now, we look at these events and the fact that Egypt, however flawed, okay, however the incomplete the revolution is, is still the fact is that Mohammed Morsi is the democratic representation of those people. 
and he has made very, for example, his solution for Syria, let's bring the Saudis and the Iranians and the Turks and e Egyptians together to find a solution, is ex exceedingly wise in, in my opinion. Why? Because I don't think, as a person believing in nonviolence, that doesn't make me, make me pacifist, and I'll explain. Uh, I think that uh, unconditional surrender should not be the option for, for example, Bashar al-Assad to go. You follow? That's, in fact, a false option. Because if you get up tomorrow morning and see Bashar al-Assad hanged by some crane and thing, that is a defeat for the long run. And still, I don't think that in the long run, Syrians will, will lose, but it will give a false satisfaction. Okay? And uh, again, if you look at all of these examples, uh, Hosni Mubarak was a, a, a military nationalist, so it's impossible for him to have run away. So he's still there, going jail, etc. Whereas Gaddafi saw himself as a tribal leader. How dare they to uh, revolt against him? So happened to him what happened. Ali Abdullah Saleh was a, is a businessman. Okay, okay. So we tell him, come go, okay, go. Now go back, okay. You know, he just does whatever uh, he wants to do. Uh, uh, the, the case in, uh, in Bahrain is, uh, again, is exceedingly important because there's a false Shiification of the revolt. Yes, the majority are Shi'is, but it doesn't, and then the absurdity that they are pro-Iran. As I wrote in an, in an article, the ruling regime model is Iran, not the revolutionaries. Arab, uh, the Yemeni uh, revolution is integral to the rest of the Arab uh, revolutions. And then the key question is, why is it that the Yemeni activists, revolutionary activists, are, are turned away from Egypt when they go to Egypt to collaborate and consult with their uh, fellow revolutionaries in Egypt? Because Morsi is, has promised the Saudis and the Bahrainis that he will not interfere in their but here we have a space, we have a voice to catch Morsi, as it were. To say, okay, when you were in Iran and gave that speech, yes, the Iranian uh, state uh, propaganda machinery changed the word Syria to Bahrain, and that was bad, and now the whole world knows. But why don't you allow Egypt, uh, uh, Bahraini activists to enter uh, Egypt? So you see, because, you see, the age, this is the, what is fantastic, is hypocrisy is exposed. The Saudis are champions of democracy in, uh, in Syria, but they don't allow Saudi women to drive. You follow? Or they invade and occupy inside Bahrain. But, you see, our, our tongue is, is liberated. We no longer can... Uh, and the problem that I have with the left is if you start saying, oh, well, you know, the, 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 the Syrian regime is not as bad as, uh, as they say. I mean, the tortures are exaggerated. All I want to do is just twist for five minutes one of these, uh, you know, cafe revolutionaries because they have never been slapped in the face once to realize what it means—the indignity of, uh, of this. That's why I say that you cannot just theory is important, an analysis is important, distance is important, but human cost is also exceedingly, exceedingly. Uh, to me, Bahrain is the Achilles heel of, uh, of the Arab revolutions. And uh, in, in my own writing, I never leave Bahrain out of my sight. I, at least once every two months or so, I write something on Bahrain and connect it to other things. The geopolitics of it, as you know, American military interests in the Persian Gulf, the Saudis are the Saudis want to, uh, you know, annex uh, Bahrain. Well, they want it to Yeah, to just be part of the... Uh, I don't want that. <laughs> yeah. And the more recent pernicious report that, in fact, they are beginning to import, transfer some uh, Syrians to, to dilute the, uh, the, the uh, uh, religious uh, composition of, uh, of uh, Bahrain. All indicates that what? That the Bahrain revolution is alive and well. Okay. that the public, they destroyed uh, the Paris world in Manama, but they cannot destroy it in, in people's mind and heart and, and so forth. So the combination of conspiracy, the United States, because of its military and regional interests, 
Saudis because of their uh, fear for their own uh, monarchy. And uh, Israel goes along because of its just the uh, largest military uh, carrier of the United States. They all have a vested interest in, the, uh, in Bahrain. And the key to, uh, to it is that Islamic Republic of Iran is not interested in, <laughs> in the Bahraini revolution. Quite to the contrary, we will happily accommodate the ruling regime of Bahrain uh, to stay in power. Because if you have a genuine, I mean, Islamic Republic is fearful not only of Bahrain, of the, of the entire Arab revolutions. Why? Because it is the return of the repressed. People now remember 30 years ago why Iranians revolted before, uh, you know, uh, uh, cultural revolutions, uh, purging of the universities, mass executions in jails, etc. All of them are now back, uh, coming back to people's minds. So Bahrain will remain. Uh, and then, I don't, if a week or two weeks or a month goes by and there's no news from Bahrain, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't mean the revolution is ended. Because something is, you have to have a, like a quilt. You have to have a gestalt view of these revolts. So far as something is happening, I, uh, this, last week there was a demonstration in, in Amman. Mm -hmm. That's good. You follow? Because then keeps everybody in. What, what, what frustrates me if when there is a demonstration in front of the American embassy in Benghazi, and people, oh, yeah, you know, the whole attention is gone into that. Or people take this Israeli uh, nonsense of the nuclear issue uh, too seriously. Now, my position on nuclear is very easy. I don't want any. Do you want nuclear? Do you have any use for nuclear uh, weapon? Why do we need a nuclear weapon? But exactly by abusing the fear of the region of a potential Islamic Republic having a, a thing, over the last year the sale of arms of the United States to these stupid regimes in the region has quadrupled ten times more arms they have been selling them. The Kuwaitis, the Bahrainis, the Qataris, etc. So again, we have to keep our eyes on the ball, and Bahrain remains paramount. Uh, Oh, post-colonialism. You know, I gave uh, my editor, then Tamzin, whom I dearly love, uh, a few subtitles. Delayed defiance, uh, post-colonial. So you pick, choose whatever you want. And she chose this one because it was most uh, provocative. I like it. Uh, well, first of all, what does it mean? Huh? You just uh, leave tonight here this book is by buying my book and go and read the chapter. I forget three, four, four five chapters. I forget one of the chapters I explained. But uh, the gist of it is that post-colonialism as a mode of knowledge production in the immediate aftermath of, uh, of uh, British, you know, collecting their uh, flag and leaving uh, India or the French from uh, North Africa or the Italians from Libya, etc. A mode of knowledge production uh, uh, began, which I divided into three modes, uh, anti-colonial nationalism, third world socialism, and militant Islamism. Those modes of ideology that were producing the aftermath of this post-colonial period have exhausted their political energy, and uh, they, which were predicated on a binary between Islam and the West. That binary between Islam and the West I'm saying it until I'm green in the face, no longer operates, it's no longer valid, as a, uh, a, a doesn't have the synergy that generates ideology. And because ideologies are formed in the public space, the reason I keep talking about the public space, because the public space is now the terra incognita of the f future emerging ideologies. This is, so I'm not the age of, oh, the ideology is over, or colonialism is over, no. Colonialism is very much inoperative but a specific historical moment that certain kind of post-colonial ideologies were being produced, I argue, has uh, ended. What was the last question? Um, public space, is it just a mosque? Oh, server? very good point, very good point. No. In fact, the significance of uh, Tahrir is that it's not uh, a mosque. The uh, Muslim Brotherhood came to public uh, to uh, Tahrir Square and was part of the Tahrir Square. But if you look at every single shot, every single vi video clip, they're part of the uh, thing. For example, the famous clip of that bridge that you see that the crowd is coming as being confronted by the, uh, the security forces. 
uh, is only three or four rows of uh, prayers. The rest are not praying. They are just uh, non-praying Muslims, as I, uh, as I call them. It is, as a result, very critical conceptually, analytically, spatially, for mosque to be incorporated into tahrir and not tahrir turned into, into a mosque. And again, this comes from historical experience. I was a 24-year-old graduate student when the Iranian revolution happened and I went to Iran. One of the most important and vital demonstrations against the Islamic Republic in the formation was in the Tehran University soccer field. It was a massive demonstration there. The, uh, the militant uh, Khomeinis invaded the, that uh, soccer uh, stadium, kicked everybody around, and from the following day they occupied it and turned it into a mosque. To this day, the so-called Friday sermons are delivered on the soccer field of Tehran University. You follow? That is the process that needs to be reversed. And the fact that... Uh, the fact that... Uh, I'm not, I've never denied the fact that Islam is integral to our political culture. Uh, that's why this binary secular, non-secular non doesn't wash. To me, it's useless binary. Muslims, as Muslims, have every right to participate in the political life of their country. But so do Armenians, so do uh, Baha'is, so do Jews, so, so do Zoroastrians, so do, even so do those who call themselves secular. I mean, there is secular fundamentalists, as you know. Huh? Secular, okay, secular. Ahlan wa Come in and join the crowd. So far as public space has its own integrity that does not discriminate. And voluntary association, any voluntary association. So I'm not, I'm not for banning uh, Muslim Brotherhood. I'm for formation of those three uh, voluntary associations that I told you. I want individuals to, this is entirely to Kvelian. Individuals to be protected by a community of like-minded, whether it's a dance group, whether it's a choir, whether it's they play piano, or whether they discuss uh, uh, Marx and Freud and whatever. You follow? So far as in the next Friday meeting, we know that uh, whatever your name is, Ahmad is not here. Where is Ahmad? Huh? We know, namely, you are protected by also Zimmel. Zimmel's notion of web of affiliation is critical. So you multiply it. So the mosque does not become, the, again, these are all from experience of the Iranian revolution. The mosque does not become the single site of the public space. And especially if you take it to the Shi clerical establishment, forget it. I mean, it's a fraternity club. They dress alike. They have the secret language that they talk with each other. You follow? And then the rest of, oh, I'm secular. And, you know, yeah, you, you have lost the game. Political participation is the key. Constant. This is what Hannah Arendt meant. 